So now you know what ions are, you know how they work, but what happens if you put electricity across them? How do ions conduct electricity? And all ions, no matter what they are, conduct electricity because they're electrically charged. It's the mixture of chemistry and electricity. So we begin with something called electrodes. You're going to have a positive electrode and a negative electrode. An electrode is just a conductor, a conductor of electricity that you put in the water, the liquid of whatever kind it is. In our case, salt water. You apply a positive voltage here and a negative voltage there. You just put your power source across, your power supply, your batteries, whatever. So if you just have water, the positive end is going to attract the oxygen end of the water because the oxygen end is negatively sticky. And technically it'll do it anywhere, but if the molecule is far away from the electrode, then, you know, inverse square diminishment. So the molecule is kind of over here. So if there's a water molecule near, then the oxygen end is going to be attracted to this. But the oxygen molecule is in motion. It's wiggling, it's turning. So then the hydrogen end, as it's heading towards it, the hydrogen end turns a little bit and now it's pushing it away. Same thing happens over here. The negative electrode is going to attract the hydrogen end, but it might spin and there's the oxygen end. And then, you know, the oxygen will bounce off. So basically nothing happens because individually things are happening. There's attraction and repulsion going on, but net overall, the Brownian motion, everything wiggling around, nothing's happening. But if you add ions, the ions are electrically charged one way or the other. So if you have your negative chlorine ion, it doesn't have a positive and negative stickiness. It only has negative stickiness and it has a lot of it. It's the whole, the whole atom really, the single atomic molecule. So this is going to be attracted hard to this electrode. This chlorine ion wanders over to this positive electrode, bam, right on it. And the same way with the sodium, positive ion is going to be attracted to the negative electrode. So what happens? Remember how the atoms are splitting and recombining and splitting and recombining just due to Brownian motion, room temperature, and nothing's really happening in the water even though the salt is dissolved? Well, what happens here is your chlorine attaches, not a, you know what I mean, it grabs onto the positive electrode, it comes close enough molecularly. This has an extra electron. It's okay with that because of the structure of the atom. It's okay having that extra electron, which is why it forms an ionic bond with sodium in the first place and accepts that electron, but it's still electrically charged. So when this chlorine comes close enough, that electron zoop, goes into the positive charge. It's sucked in like a vacuum. And then the chlorine just becomes Cl. It's no longer an ion, it's just an atom. And it's fine with that too because it's electrically neutral. It's perfectly fine getting an electron and it's perfectly fine losing it. So it has carried that charge from somewhere in the water over to the electrode and the electron has gone in there. And then another chlorine minus ion comes over there and this electron also gets sucked right in. So you get another Cl, electrically neutral, and they're over by the electrode. They're close together, which makes it much more likely that they're going to interact. What happens when they interact? It becomes Cl2. That is a stable state for electrically neutral chlorine ions. They don't do it normally because it's negative and negative. They repel each other. They don't usually just become Cl2 on their own. You're not going to get, you know, Cl2 minus minus because they're going to repel each other. They're not going to combine that way. But once they're electrically neutral, they're not repelling each other. They can join together and become Cl2, which is also called chlorine gas, which is banned by the Geneva Convention. Oops, don't do that. You don't want that in your eyes or lungs. So that's the positive electrode. Over here, we got this sodium going on. Let me move this away a bit. Let's have an Na+. Positively charged sodium ion gets sucked over to the negative electrode. The negative electrode is trying to push electrons into the water because negative is too many electrons, positive is not enough electrons. So this sodium wanders over here and you get an electron coming out of this electrode whoop, right onto sodium, which is no longer positive. Now it's just a sodium atom, not an ion, and it's electrically neutral. Sodium is perfectly fine losing an electron. That's why it forms the ionic bond and gives up its electron to the chlorine to make salt. But it's also perfectly fine being electrically neutral because everything is. Let's say we have another sodium ion that wanders over. Here comes another electron zoop, over onto the sodium. Now we have two sodium atoms that are perfectly fine coming together because before they were both positively charged, so they repel each other, but now they're neutral. But nothing happens. I faked you out. Na2, it's not really a thing. However, there's another thing. Remember how I was saying H2O becomes H 
plus and OH minus, the water dissolves itself and it doesn't happen that much. Remember, it happens a whole lot slower. That's why water doesn't really dissolve itself. This happens, but we don't really say it dissolves itself. But some of it forms now and then and recombines, but hydrogen. What if we have hydrogen? H plus, H plus, they get their electrons to become neutral hydrogen atoms. Guess what? H2 is, that's hydrogen gas, which is flammable and in high enough quantities, explosive. Whoops, don't do that. But it's perfectly fine to breathe, again, in small quantities. It's just going to make your voice just a tiny bit higher like helium does. But don't light a match. So now you're saying, well, you've missed one. What about your hydroxide? OH minus. Well, yeah, the OH minus will come over. It'll drop its electron right onto that electrode. Another OH minus, and then you get your electrically neutral OHs, and then nothing really happens because you don't really have H2O2 coming from this. If you want H2O2, you got to do some fancier stuff. So what happens to the sodium and hydroxide? The chlorine goes up in the air, the hydrogen goes up in the air, and you're left with Na and OH, both electrically neutral, or maybe not. Some of it's just in there. It hasn't reacted with any electrodes. It's just been dissolved. Well, NaOH is a thing. So whether it's lost or gained electrons from the electrodes or not, you have your NaOH forming sodium and hydroxide equals sodium hydroxide, also known as caustic soda, which is a very strong alkali that will dissolve your skin. And its use as fertilizer or pesticide, I forget which, is banned in Europe. Oops, don't do that. Of course, it's got all kinds of nice safe uses. Just don't stick your hand in it. And if you get your hand in it or you get some on your hand, go rinse it off because it's soluble in water. Funny that. So you go rinse your hand off. You got plenty of water. It's just going to dissolve it right off your hand. Good deal. But why is this even an issue? Why does this form? Well, here's the thing. Neutral salt water. If you just have water and salt in it, then this is forming and breaking apart and forming and breaking apart. Just like the salt is, just like the water is. But we're losing chlorine gas. We're losing hydrogen gas. So there's fewer molecules or atoms, really, of hydrogen available to grab onto the hydroxides. There's fewer atoms of chlorine to grab onto the sodium. So what happens is you just get extra. You get a whole lot more of this forming and not becoming other byproducts. It doesn't become this and then this and then this and then this and then this. It basically becomes just this. And eventually enough of it forms that the water is not enough to dissolve it anymore. There's just too much of it forming in there. It's combining into NaOH faster than the NaOH is being broken apart by the water and you get caustic soda. That's not good. Also, if you have this solution, the solution of water and caustic soda when you're done and you let it evaporate, well, the water's going to evaporate. The NaOH really isn't. So the water's going to go away and it's going to leave caustic soda. So if you want to make caustic soda, you can do it this way. I'm sure if you actually look up a chemistry document, there's a far easier way. But that's what's going on. So forget caustic soda for a minute. The main deal was the hydrogen and the chlorine gas being formed because the chlorine negative ions are giving up electrons into the positive electrode. The positive hydrogen ions are taking electrons from the negative electrode in roughly equal numbers, assuming your electrodes are the same surface area and material and stuff. If you've got two identical electrodes, guess what? You've got electrons going in here and coming out of here, and so you have current flow. In a wire, the electrons are basically bouncing from atom to atom to atom, sort of like water through a water pipe. It's a common analogy. But there are not little taxicabs. The ions are not going from one end to the other. It's just chemistry. Ions that are near here will give up electrons. Ions that are near here will grab electrons. And then in the middle is just atoms, molecules bouncing around, recombining, splitting again. And where's the energy coming from? Because you're applying the voltage, but the voltage is only taking electrons on and off of these atoms. It's not making them move. Temperature is. They are receiving energy from the air around us. Room temperature. Brownian motion. So that's why the chemistry works, because when the electrons are not acting on these atoms, these molecules, they're acting on each other by random chance by bouncing around and into each other, because they have energy from room temperature. That's, again, why chemistry happens faster if it's warm. Remember when I used the warm warm tap water instead of the cold tap water in my first video in the series, the resistance went down. It was conducting current faster because everything was moving faster. In order to take electrons into this electrode, you have to have chlorine ions. You have to have hydrogen ions over here. So if these atoms were motionless, you know, whichever ones were near 
would lose their electrons or gain electrons, and then it would stop. The whole reaction would stop because nothing's bouncing, nothing's changing. You're not getting a fresh supply of ions. But because of room temperature, everything's bouncing and reacting, recombining, redissolving, and you're getting a fresh supply of ions until you run out because you're losing chlorine, you're losing hydrogen, and eventually all you'll be left with is caustic soda. And your room will be on fire, and your eyes will be bleeding if you don't have a good fume hood. So don't do that. But that is electrolysis. That's what electrolysis is. It's chemistry meets electricity. Because all the, all the wires care about is electrons are going in that way and coming out of this way. Doesn't care how. You could be sitting there with tweezers and moving them for all it cares. All it matters is there's a supply of electrons here and it's getting rid of electrons here. And ions will do that. So what is this good for besides making hydrogen gas, chlorine gas, and caustic soda? Well, here's the thing. These electrodes could be reactive. I've assumed that these electrodes are just there to supply and take the electrons. What if they are chemically reactive as well? What if, let's say, this one is copper. What if this is made of copper, the positive electrode? Then you have itching by electrolysis. And there's, of course, better electrolytic solutions, but I'm just going to stick to salt water because it's easy to get. Well, I guess etching solution is really easy to get, but it's just salt water. Until you do the electrolysis, it's perfectly safe. So it's nice and easy household ingredients. And then you can just get your metal at the hardware store, whatever you want to etch. But how does the etching work? How do reactive electrodes factor into this? I'll get to that in my next video. For now, I'll be seeing you.